Hello, my name is Ian Sinjim, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to the latest in my series of the Sinjin's Pipecasts. Our topic today is the way in which historians have variously interpreted and written about the career of the 19th century British politician and Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. Now it's fair to say, I think, that historians have been rather kinder to Disraeli than were his contemporaries. To his contemporaries, Disraeli was also always a divisive figure who generated strong reactions, sometimes positive, more usually negative. He was routinely seen as unprincipled, ambitious, untrustworthy, insincere and socially climbing. As depicted in the pages of Punch, Disraeli was always Jewish and always up to something mischievous, cunning, dishonest and in some way disreputable. He was basically a political rogue. Is this how historians see him today? Well in some ways yes. Disraeli is still often seen as opportunistic. He is recognised to have been a social climber. He is usually regarded as having lacking a coherent set of political principles. And historians have come to attach more, not less importance, to his Jewishness in recent years. But despite all this, the Israeli stock rose rapidly after his death and has never wholly lost its value. I don't believe I am wrong if I say that Disraeli is about the only 19th century British politician whose name and thoughts are regularly evoked in contemporary controversy. Why was this? The basic reason is that Disraeli quite quickly became a conservative icon. He was the one 19th century big political beast whose name resonated through into the Edwardian era and beyond. In the course of a long political career, which began in 1831 and ended in 1881, this really articulated a set of ideas and policies that spoke to that perennial conservative problem, namely of how to get ordinary people to vote for them. The conservatives found it easy enough to appeal to the country gentry and village England. They found it much more challenging to know how to appeal to the urban middle class and even the working class who had traditionally voted liberal when they'd voted at all. The Israeli was the one conservative leader whose personality seemed to resonate with the middle and lower class voters. It's enough to cast one's eye over some of the others to realise why. Lord Liverpool an uninspiring compromiser, whom Disraeli himself condemned to political oblivion when he labelled him the arch mediocrity. Robert Peel, lacking in charisma, his smile described as being like the golden plate on a coffin, and worse still, he betrayed his own party by repealing the Corn Laws in 1846. Lord Derby, the good thing about Lord Derby is that he was Conservative Prime Minister on three occasions. The problem was, no one had ever heard of him. Lord Salisbury, remote, impossibly grand, aristocratic, and with a beard that would make even a hipster blanche. This really just left Disraeli. Of course, there are plenty of things about Disraeli that are potentially embarrassing to the Conservatives. He was, and remains, the most unlikely leader the Conservatives ever had. He had no money, quite the opposite. He spent most of his life in debt, and his financial troubles began early. By the age of 20, a series of disastrous speculations in South American mining shares left him with debts worth about £120,000 in contemporary values. And for the numbers, he was continually forced to renegotiate his debts, going from one moneylender to another. He attended neither 
public school nor university. After going to a small private school in Walthamstow, he entered a solicitor's office. He hardly knew Greek or Latin, or even French. The Israeli had no land or connections. He was born in Bloomsbury in 1804, the son of an author. It is true that he did acquire a modest estate, and a decently grand country house at Hewenham. But these were bought for him by his aristocratic patrons. He had no career or connections, and his main source of income was his novels. Indeed, he once described himself as a man of the press. Well, in those days, journalism had an even far lower reputation than it does today. He wasn't even English. He was a third generation Italian. His grandfather arriving in England in 1748. There was not a single drop of English blood in his veins. Disraeli's political career was notoriously dissolute. After first entering politics in 1832 as a radical, he then sought to become a Whig. And when this failed, he sought advancement through the Conservatives. No wonder he once asked in an early novel, Am I a Whig or a Tory? I forget. As for the Tories, I admire antiquity, particularly a ruin. I think I am a Tory. But then the Whigs have such good dinners and the most amusing. I think I am a Whig. Everyone knew him to be a charlatan, and for most of his career, his own party would gladly have got shot of him. Above all, of course, he was a Jew. Not technically. While he was born a Jew, at the age of 12, he was baptised a Christian, after his father, an agnostic, had a dispute with the Bevis Mark Synagogue in London. This was crucial, for without this conversion, the Israeli could have had no political career at all, because Jews were not allowed to become MPs until 1859. Even so to contemporaries, he was, and always remained, a Jew. He came from a Jewish family, and his name, the Israeli, proclaimed the fact. Now we today don't need to be told of the damaging effects of anti-Semitism in politics, and this is in our politically correct age. Just imagine what anti-Semitism was like in the 19th century. Well, it was quite a respectable and even expected attitude. Punch cartoons were notorious for playing upon this Semitic oddness of Disraeli. Disraeli was, in short, about as unqualified to be Tory leader as anyone could be. A.G.P. Taylor once compared the idea of Disraeli as Conservative leader to that of a medieval monk who, once hearing a description of an elephant, replied, Sir, there is no such animal. Yet Disraeli actually existed. And the Conservatives needed him in a democratic age, especially when the Liberals were led by such a charismatic phenomenon as William Gladstone. And there were in fact a lot of things about Disraeli that could be spun in an attractive way. He was a self-made man who had advanced by the sheer force of ability to an earldom. Though born a Jew, Disraeli converted to Christianity and was accepted as such by the Conservative Party and became its leader, a phenomenon of European renown. He was the politician who discerned the idea of the British Empire and made it integral to Tory, to Tory politics. He was the devoted servant of Queen Victoria and helped draw her out of seclusion, won her admiration, and of course made her Empress of India. Disraeli was the Conservative leader who said that the social welfare of the people was the first claim upon the government, and took important steps to improve the condition of the working class. In 1867, he extended the right to vote to a large share of the working class. Disraeli was the Tory who goaded, teased and occasionally defeated the great self-righteous liberal prig Gladstone, who he famously described as being inebriated by the exuberance of his own verbosity. And he was the wit and writer 
who inspired Oscar Wilde, invented the political novel, and once said, if I want to read a novel, I write one. Yes, there really was a lot to love about Disraeli, and a series of Tories, beginning with Lord Randolph Churchill, evoked his name. In this context, the early historians of Disraeli felt no incongruity in depicting him as one of the greatest statesmen of the, of the 19th century. In terms of the historical writing about Disraeli, two great biographies stand out. The first was written by Money, Penny and Buckle between 1910 and 1920, and the second was authored by Robert Blake and published in 1966. Both are justly famous as outstanding political biographies, and both were written by conservatives. Both also paid tribute to Disraeli's accomplishments, though in different ways. Let's just take first Money, Penny and Buckle. Now this is one of the great tombstone biographies and appeared originally in six volumes. My own 1929 thin paper edition runs to something like 3,000 pages. It was actually a project commissioned by the Times newspaper which from its earlier liberal traditions was by 1910 firmly in the conservative camp. The biography was begun by William Moneypenny, an Ulsterman and journalist who had edited a newspaper in South Africa and volunteered to fight in the Boer War. Returning to England, he joined the staff of the Times, who then chose him to write the official biography of the Israeli based on the papers of the Israeli's private secretary Montague Corry. Unfortunately, having just completed the first volume, Money Penny died of a heart attack. He was succeeded by George Buckle, who had become editor of the Times in 1889 at the tender age of 29. He remained editor until 1911, when he was sacked by Lord Northcliffe and given as a sop the job of finishing Money Penny's biography, which he did nine years and five volumes later. And this remains the basic text. It took Disraeli seriously and quoted extensively from his letters and papers. It argued that Disraeli had true conservative principles, that his career had consistent themes such as care for the poor, that he was a great statesman of global vision, whose approach to foreign policy culminated in the triumph of the Congress of Berlin in 1878, and that Disraeli was indeed a worthy embodiment of the conservative tradition for the 20th century. We turn next to Robert Blake, and this the next and still most, to this day, the most important major re-evaluation of Disraeli's career was provided by Blake in his 1966 biography. This too is a superb political biography widely regarded as a classic of its type. Blake was a notable Oxford academic. Having studied PPE in the 1930s, he fought in Italy during the Second World War, was captured by the Italians, then escaped. Returning to Oxford, he was a tutor at Christchurch and then provost of the Queen's College. Blake was a lifelong conservative in politics and was made a peer in 1971 and was one of the very few Oxford academics who supported the idea of presenting Margaret Thatcher with an honorary degree. Blake's biography drew heavily upon that of Money, Penny and Buckle, but it was much shorter and more readable, coming in at a mere 766 pages. More importantly, appearing in the 1960s, it was part of a more sceptical and critical reading of Disraeli's career, in which his opportunism was more frankly admitted. Yes, said Blake, Disraeli had political ideas, he just didn't apply them in practice. Disraeli was less a statesman and more a great politician, who took the job of opposition politics more seriously than ever had been done before, and who used deft tactics and flexible manoeuvres to challenge Gladstone, 
and eventually win a great conservative victory in 1874. This work of Blake's appeared at the time as a series of other important books which re-evaluated Disraeli in a far more opportunistic fashion. Notably Paul Smith's work on Disraeli as a social reformer and Morris Cowling's book on the 1867 Reform Act. Paul Smith, for example, unleashed a lethal attack upon the idea that Disraeli was a politician with a special interest in social reform and that who'd laid the foundations for the welfare state with his government reforms of 1875, which included, for example, appointing medical officers to oversee public health and passing legislation to prevent the polluting of rivers and the testing of food and drugs and indeed even began a program of clearing the most unhealthy slum housing. Now such a notion of Disraeli the great social reformer was obviously an appealing one for the Conservatives as they sought to attract working class voters in the age of democracy. But Smith showed that Disraeli had no real interest in social reform, that he took little part in the legislation enacted in his name, that most of it would have happened anyway, that when key elements like trade union reform were being discussed in cabinet, the 70 year old Disraeli nodded off to sleep, and that the actual legislative work was done by his Home Secretary Richard Cross. Disraeli, it seemed, was no architect of the modern welfare state. The upshot of these works was thus to consolidate the idea that Disraeli was a brilliant political tactician, but not really a politician of principle. And in this way, these works really took us back closer to the contemporary estimations. And this, it must be said, is pretty much where interpretations of Disraeli rest today. Now in more recent years, attention has focused particularly on the role of ideas in Disraeli's politics. What distinguishes Disraeli from most British politicians is that he actually had ideas, a lot of them, and over a career of 50 years he articulated them in speeches and debates, newspaper articles, and above all through his novels. Disraeli began his public life as a novelist, and even at his death he left unfinished a novel called Falconet. He is still, I think, the only British Prime Minister to have written a novel after leaving office. Two questions have then arisen. Did Disraeli in fact have a distinctive ideology, and did it in some way shape his actual politics? As noted, Lord Blake was the leading sceptic in this regard. Blake acknowledged that Disraeli possessed a core political ideology, namely a belief in the virtue of the territorial constitution, by which he meant a hierarchical society in which power was tied to the possession of land. The lords, commons, king, church, universities, all elements of this territorial system, which was essentially a feudal order. Blake argued that Disraeli never, never departed from his attachment to the merits of this system, which he held sustained the traditional liberties of Englishmen and ensured that power was not focused in a centralised state, as for example in France. But what did, what did this really add up to? To be frank, one could hardly be a Conservative at all and not believe in the landed hierarchy. In the 19th century most people did. Gladstone included. Debate really centred upon how to uphold it. And in this there's nothing particularly distinctive about Disraeli's politics, at least after his flirtation with the Young England aristocratic faction of the 1840s, which itself was really a means by which Disraeli could attack his then leader, Robert Peel, who was setting about repealing the Corn Laws. Disraeli, in short, had ideas but he behaved just like any other politician. A more imaginative engagement with Disraeli's ideas was made by the historian John Vincent in his contribution to the Past Masters series, 
In this quirky and brilliant little book, Vincent took few prisoners, contending that Disraeli was a political failure, that he was a poor opposition leader, losing five out of the six general elections that he fought, that he had no interest in social reform, and that he didn't even like his beloved aristocracy. What distinguished Vincent's work was his emphasis on Disraeli as a writer and thinker. This, he argued, was the sphere of Disraeli's greatness. According to Vincent, what Disraeli saw was that if the Conservatives were to have any chance politically, they had to break the liberal monopoly of ideas. In the mid-19th century, the Liberals had the intellectual high ground with their doctrines of individualism, free trade, minimal government and religious toleration. In this context, it was easy for John Stuart Mill to label the Tories the stupid party. It was this that Disraeli challenged, and he did so by taking the fight straight to the Liberals. Now, many of you will be familiar, I think, with the Whig interpretation of history, according to which English history consists of a gradual extension of civil liberties and democratic freedoms, one piecemeal from the resistance of monarchs and aristocratic elites. The Whigs, it was said, were the leaders of this movement, tracing their lineage back to the struggle against Charles I, and then in 1689 engineering the removal of James II, and his replacement William of Orange, under the authority of Parliament, thereby ensuring that Britain would remain a parliamentary monarchy. Through the 18th century, the Whigs kept the Hanoverian monarchs in check, and all this culminated in the Reform Act of 1832, by which the Whigs brought electoral reform and extended the vote to the middle class. Whig aristocrats like Grey, Althrop and Russell were thus the friends of the people and the guardian of English freedoms. Well, Disraeli would have none of this. For Disraeli too, English history was a story of the growth of liberty. But this was brought about by the Tories, not the Whigs. The Tories were the true party of popular rights in England, whereas the Whigs were an aristocratic elite, a selfish oligarchy, who used popular rhetoric as a fig leaf for their exclusive interests. Where the Whigs were an aristocratic cabal, governing, the support, governing with the support of the middle class, the Tories were the party of the English nation uniting country gentry, farmers, rural labourers and urban workers. The Tories were the National Party, rooted in English history and loving such institutions as the monarchy, House of Lords, ancient universities and the Church of England. This was the origin of the famous idea of one nation. While Disraeli did not actually use this phrase, it was an idea that was powerfully present in his thinking. Bit by bit, he pushed the idea that the Conservatives were the party of the nation, whereas the Liberals were an un-English elite dominated by French ideas. And by the 1870s, these arguments began to tell, as Gladstone Liberals were depicted as restless, alien ideologues governing in the sectional interest. And it was Disraeli's Conservatives that were the party of the real England of tradition, pragmatism and Anglicanism. And from this it was a short step to say that the Tories were the party of social reform in the interests of the working class and the party of empire. It was a highly innovative set of ideas and it broke the hold of liberal ideology in British politics. And it was all the more remarkable in being the creation of a literary London Jew of Italian origin. It's one of those delicious ironies of history. Of course, whether this conservative one nation ideology was true or a good thing are very different questions. It's not hard to see them feeding into the trend towards social imperialism and the scramble for colonies, growing nationalism and ultimately World War One. 
just as one hears echoes of it now in the fierce debates that surrounded Brexit. People like Nigel Farage and Rees Mogg are in the tradition of Disraeli, opposing the English nation to the European elite, and like Michael Gove, decrying experts, something Disraeli was definitely prone to do. For don't we all recall perhaps Disraeli's most famous remark, there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. In Vincent's world, Disraeli was a kind of political Charles Dickens. He didn't want to abolish class, or reduce inequality, or even do much for social reform. What he wanted to do was smooth over these fissures by spreading political goodwill. If the English could unite around a collective love of their country and its institutions, they would forget about the class war. In this regard, Scrooge, after his Christmas Eve of torment, was the ideal Disraeli individual. He wasn't really proposing to, to end the poverty of Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim, but he was going to provide them with a big turkey and lashings of good Christmas cheer. And that really is what Disraeli wanted to do. Where the Liberals critiqued and reformed and bemoaned, the Tories would celebrate and unite and value the nation as it was. Another historian who has accorded much importance to Disraeli's ideas is Paul Smith. Now Paul Smith, you may recall, was one of those 1960s historians who pushed an opportunistic and unideological interpretation of Disraeli's politics. But in the 1980s, Smith revisited the question of Disraeli's ideas, and he now interpreted them in the light of postmodernism. For Disraeli, ideas were not so much true or false as useful or not. Disraeli used ideas to make a political world within which he could exist. And by Jove he needed to, since, as we remarked, he was really a political impossibility. That he existed, and even thrived, owed a huge amount to his clever, audacious and imaginative use of, what, of ideas. Disraeli was far more intellectually nimble than his contemporaries and, through his cleverness, he was able to win a position for himself. It especially helped in this regard that he was a member of the Conservative Party, that party of inarticulate country gentry that would rather chase foxes than read parliamentary papers. Like some will-o'-the-wisp, he danced before these rustic simpletons who found themselves mesmerised by Disraeli, however much they despised him. Most, of, most dramatically, Disraeli confronted head-on the question of his Jewishness. Obviously, Disraeli was a Jew, but far from being embarrassed by that fact and trying to disguise it, he celebrated it and endeavoured to turn his Jewishness into an asset. He did this in three ways. First, he proclaimed that race was the key to history. Disraeli was an openly racial thinker. Race, for him, was everything. Life was a struggle between the races. And among these races, Disraeli subscribed to the then common view that the purer the race, the better it was. And here was his first trump card. For, unlike the mongrel Anglo-Saxons, the Jews were the purest race of all, and therefore the best. So he's really proclaimed a doctrine of Jewish racial superior superiority. The Jews were a master race. Look among any section of society, he said, and you will find at its head the Jew. Jews were the greatest philosophers, the greatest bankers, the greatest composers, the greatest boxers, the greatest criminals. Indeed, rather like later anti-Semites, anti he believed that Jews secretly ran the world from their positions of power and influence. 
being a Jew was a matter of pride, not of shame. Second, within the Jewish race there were different lineages. And not only was the Israeli a Sephardic Jew, which was the most prestigious and longer established community of European Jews, but he was, he said, a Sephardic Jew of Spanish origins, which meant he was an aristocratic member of an aristocratic race, and therefore need concede no social deference to anyone. It is not clear this was true, but the Israeli thought it was, and that was enough. Third, as to the, as to the religious disabilities of being a Jew, the Israeli simply rejected the premise altogether. Christianity was a Jewish religion. Mary was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. The Old Testament was a Jewish book. The Israeli argued that Christianity was merely completed Judaism. He was, what is nowadays sometimes called, a Jew for Jesus. And thus he argued to bemused MPs, Jews should be admitted to Parliament, not as the Liberals would have it, for reasons of religious toleration, because they were basically Christians and vice versa. As he memorably remarked, he himself was just a blank page between the Old Testament and the New. So, Smith points out, the Israeli was able to use ideas to make his own political career possible. And indeed, it was almost necessary for his psychological well-being. Instead of forever being on the back foot, viewed as a social and racial inferior, he was able to position himself as an exotic outsider, a natural aristocrat from a superior race, and thus more than, ab ab more than able to command the highest offices and the respect of princes. I'm not saying that this is true, or even that Disraeli genuinely believed it. This, we have, I must say, is doubtful. His great friend Lord Stanley was pained to record in his diary that Disraeli had no real religious beliefs and treated the subject with mockery. What I'm saying is that Disraeli constructed these ideas. He made use of them and used them, and they helped him to sustain a political career in a world which ought to, and often did, look down upon him as an alien interloper. It was the genius of Disraeli to unashamedly turn the weapons of his opponents back upon themselves. Yes, he said, I am Disraeli the adventurer, Disraeli the Asiatic mystery, Disraeli the un-English alien, Disraeli the blank page between the Old Testament and the New, and I am the leader of the Conservative Party, the intimate friend of Queen Victoria, the Earl of Beaconsfield, and the upholder of the Territorial Constitution of England. It was almost outlandish, but it was true. Now I must say, when turning to the details of Disraeli's career, that just about everything that Disraeli did politically has been subject to acute debate. There is no fixed view about Disraeli, and in writing my own book on, historic, on the historiographical treatment of Glass and Disraeli, even I was surprised by the fact that on every major question, serious historians have advanced explanations and interpretations that are diametrically opposed. In other words, when one lifts up the stone of conventional narrative, one finds a riotous melee of arguing historians. To give you just a taste, let us consider one of the most controversial incidents in Disraeli's career. Namely, why did Disraeli, when Conservative leader of the House of Commons, pass in 1867 a radical reform bill which gave one million working class men the vote? A particular edgy supply to this question by the fact that only, a f only one year before, Disraeli helped to defeat a more moderate Liberal bill, enfranchising only half that number, on grounds that it was radical and unnecessary. Four main explanations for this vault face have been advanced. First, 
it's been argued that Israeli was always a Tory Democrat and that he actively wanted to enfranchise the working class, whom he saw as an essential conservative foundation of the nation. This was the argument Israeli himself gave after the bill had passed, and it was the idea championed by Randolph Churchill and the populist Tories that came afterwards. As I hope you can see, bringing the working class within the political process could be easily defended on One Nation principles. However, this view hardly survived the more sceptical historians of the 1960s. If it was said that Israeli truly favoured giving the working class the vote, why did he not try and do so earlier? Why did he try to fix borough boundaries to limit as much as possible the impact of the working class vote? And why did he initially seek to limit the number of new working class voters? Quite simply, there's no real evidence for the Tory Democrat theory at the time. It was always much more of a veneer placed on events once that already happened. A second theory contends that Disraeli and the Conservatives were pushed into reform they did not want to see because of a developing popular clamour for reform, which, if not appeased, threatened escalating violence. In the summer of 1866, there was violence in Hyde Park after a pro-reform meeting was declared illegal. Railings were pushed down, flowers were trampled, policemen injured. At the same time, the radical liberal John Bright spoke to large crowds in the Midlands and North, arguing the case for reform. The idea that this reform pressure played a role in pushing the Conservatives into reforming has found wide support among historians. The Liberal politician John Morley, in his great biography of Gladstone, claimed the secret of the strange reversal in 1867 of all that had been said, attempted and done in 1866, would seem to be that the tide of public opinion had suddenly swelled into a flood. This view has found supporters through the years. Paul Smith, Frieda Harcourt, G.M. Trevelyan and F.B. Smith have all given it some credence. And it is well known that Queen Victoria was alarmed by the unrest and wanted reform dealt with. But again, many major writers have scotched the idea. Money, Penny and Buckle rejected it. Though of course you might say they would do so as it reduced their hero Disraeli to a reactive role. The most significant post-war critic was Maurice Cowling, who in a path-breaking study of the 1867 Reform Bill, claimed that Parliament in the 1860s was not afraid of public agitation, nor were its actions determined by it. Timing for one counts against this explanation. The Hyde Park riots were in July 1866, and the Reform Bill was not introduced until a full six months later. The Israeli and other leading Tories did not ignore the unrest, but it's hardly of sufficient extent or seriousness to coerce them into doing something they didn't already wish to do. Third, since the work of Cowling and F. B. Smith in 1967, most historians have located the motives of the Reform Act in parliamentary tactics in, the, in that year. The Conservatives saw that a reform bill was inevitable. It therefore made sense for them to spike the Liberal guns and bring it in themselves. This had several advantages. It would enable them to refine it in their own interests. It would give them a reason to remain in power while the bill was passed, and it would humiliate Gladstone, whose own 1866 bill had been defeated. As a result, Disraeli, who oversaw the passage of the bill, opted for a simple measure under which any person paying rates in a borough seat would get the vote. This would end any further clamour for reform, since no one thought that a person not paying rates could possibly be trusted with the vote. Few believed in manhood suffrage. 
At first, Israeli really tried to hedge the right to vote around with various restrictions, such as a voter had to have lived in the same house for at least two years, and lodgers wouldn't get the vote, and neither would those who paid rates via their landlord, what were called compounders. But what then happened was that the Conservatives, who were in a minority in the House of Commons, had to take amendment after amendment moved by Liberal backbenchers just to keep the bill alive. This is what Disraeli did, and in the process the bill became more and more radical. The residency requirement was reduced from two years to one. Some lodgers got the vote, and even the compounders got the vote. By these means, the numbers getting the vote effectively doubled. But Disraeli didn't care. What he cared about was defeating Gladstone, and this he did. This led to a, a famous Victorian joke. Why is Glaston like a telescope? Because the Israeli opens him out, sees through him, and shuts him up. The 1860 Reform Act was as a prime example of Disraeli the opportunist, who played politics like a game. Toy democracy had nothing to do with it. Lastly, Angus Hawkins of Oxford argued that the real author of the Reform Act was not Disraeli at all, it was Lord Derby. When the Conservatives found themselves in power, after the Liberals collapsed following the failure of their own 1866 reform bill, Disraeli wanted no reform at all. He then proposed a Royal Commission to kick the subject into the long grass. It was Derby who insisted that the Conservatives push on with their own reform measure, and Derby who first proposed the radical expedient of giving the vote to all men who paid rates on property. It was Derby who set the direction of travel, and Disraeli, being the one in the House of Commons, who merely implemented it. As this short example illustrates, I think, there are deep controversies between historians in how even the most essential elements of Disraeli's career are to be understood. This is, of course, true of all historical events, and at one level, the solution is merely to merge the competing perspectives into a kind of grand synthesis. So here, for example, it's not difficult to say that the Reform Act represented the combined effect of the Conservatives' political opportunism and Derby's own conviction that reform was necessary, an underlying fear of popular unrest, and Disraeli's own willingness to enfranchise the working man as part of a one-nation ideology. The problem with such a synthesis, and such synthesis like this, is that they blur causality to such a degree that one is, by the end, unable to say exactly why the Reform Act happened. As ever in history, we risk lapsing back into the comforting arms of narrative. But there's a deeper issue here, I think, to rationalise through synthesis is to obscure the essential enigma that is Disraeli himself. We've emphasised the curiousness of Disraeli as a political phenomenon. He was a complex compound of contradictions. Novelist, Jew, bankrupt, Italian, loner, monarchist, racial thinker, sympathiser for the poor, lover of lover of aristocratic privilege, little Englander, prophet of global empire, atheist, and champion of the Church of England. Disraeli was all these things, and he realised that the only way to cohere at all was to discard any logical system and keep everyone guessing through the playful juxtaposition of opposites. It was said of Disraeli that he never laughed but rather smiled at the folly of the world around him, through which he passed, as Lytton Strachey once remarked, like an enigmatic sphinx. A sphinx who, as Bismarck once said of Disraeli's friend Napoleon III, a sphinx that was without a riddle. This is why as a figure he always fascinates and never quite dates. Because while he may have been a great Victorian, 
He really was no Victorian. Thank you.